Is Germany losing its mojo? Europe's biggest economy is steadily sliding downward in international rankings. And now its leading industry looks to be losing speed. Germany's formerly venerable car makers, once responsible for more exports, turnover and jobs than any other branch of the economy, risk being surpassed by electric vehicles made in China. Were car makers asleep at the wheel? And are tariffs, like those imposed by Washington, the answer? Or could they put globalization into reverse? Today, we're asking, electric shock. Is China overtaking car country Germany? Welcome to To The Point. It is a pleasure to greet our guests, beginning with Felix Lee, who writes for the online website China Table Professional Briefing. He has reported from Beijing as Chinese correspondent for numerous German language media. Great to have you with us. And it's a pleasure to welcome my colleague Clifford Kunin. He's an editor and China analyst at DW, and he previously served for over 15 years as the Irish Times China correspondent. And joining us virtually is Beatrix Keim. She is Director of Business Development and China at the Carr Center for Automotive Research. And she joins us, as we see, uh, online. And Clifford, if I may, let me, uh, let me start with you. Germany does remain the world's third largest economy, but it's e competitiveness rankings are absolutely languishing. And in fact, the growth rate lags behind that of many other EU member countries. Would you say that Europe's economic motor is stalling? I think Germany has a lot of strength. It's a very, it's a very powerful economy. It's got great scale. It's a, it's a fantastic trading nation. It has all of these strengths. But I do sense that there's a lack of flexibility that is becoming endemic in the system and making it very difficult to compete, particularly when it comes to, to countries like China, which can move, which are much faster moving than, than Germany. At the same time, you start thinking about uh, Nokia or Kodak. You think about these, these great brands that sort of disappeared. And when you think about German car makers, you think about similar things happening in in. Uh, to German car makers, largely because of this inflexibility. So I think it's probably fair to say that with the big industries in Germany in particular, uh, the lack of flexibility and the, the failure to adapt in many ways to the changing environment, particularly when it comes to the world of online, uh, is, is working against it. Beatrix, would you agree with that? To what degree would you say that the problems of the car makers are symptomatic for the German economy as a whole? A little bit it is, because um, as you said by yourself, the, the car industry is a driver of economy. It is kind of the front runner, the pioneer in a lot of things, and many people are identifying with it. Yet I think everybody woke up, especially with the wake-up call from China, which was identifying that the e-technologies or new energy technologies are the way to beat the established car makers in the, against the internal combustion engine technology. So there is a wake-up call has been heard. And on the other side, there is, as typically for Germany, the small and medium enterprises are the engine of the Chinese technology drive. And they are still here in Germany. It's a lot of German and European small and medium enterprises in the supplier industry for the automotive industry and for the e-technology, which I think are still driving forward and will push up again. And everybody woke up. I'm convinced of that. Felix, with China's share of German EV imports surging, Germany's economy minister, Robert Habeck, is now in China. And he says the auto industry here does remain the key industry for the German economy. He's hoping, clearly, to shore up that position on this trip. But what can he possibly achieve? Well, um, uh it's it's a fact that the German automotive uh, industry is the most important industry of Germany. And to be honest, I mean, who profited most of China's economic rise? It was Germany. And who profited 
which industry profited most, it was the car industry, the German car in industry. And now China's economy itself is not doing very well. And now we have all these geopolitical conflicts. And of course, Germany is hurt most from all of the, uh, in comparison to the European countries and the car, uh, car industry especially. Um, besides all these aspects, uh, there's another problem with uh, that uh, uh, the, Chinese, uh, the German car companies have slept in the last three years in technology development, what was happening in, in, in China. This is actually quite similar to the pandemic, the three years of pandemic. Everyone was in Germany was dealing with the pandemic. Obviously, all the German car uh, representatives who are in a quite number in China also was de were dealing with the pandemic and they didn't see that the technology, the technology development of the Chinese car companies have, uh, have continued. And, and, and this is a gap now and uh, now the Germans are trying to catch up and it's not an easy task. Uh, Clifford, one reason that both uh, the Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the economy minister have made the pilgrimage to China is that, in fact, it has been a very important market for German exporters. Uh, Beatrix mentioned the role of small and medium enterprises that also sell, for example, tool-making machines. But luxury cars made in Germany were also long a prized export in China. Is that uh, open road now closing? I think the German auto industry is very diverse and I think you've got also very diverse views on China within that auto industry. A lot of the small and medium sized firms, for example, have seen their technology be transferred or, or um, copied by Chinese companies and they really resent that and are fearful about building a Chinese market. At the same time, the big car makers are, are driving a political debate and they've got much more political weight in a way than the, the smaller companies. So I think... Um, I don't think there's unity of, of purpose when it comes to China within Germany. I think there's a big difference between what Olaf Scholz thinks and what the economy minister Habeck thinks, because they both have, have very different views on this. So I think um, uh, one is, is very opposed to, to greater engagement with China and one not so. So I think, um, I think Germany, the German car industry is in crisis. It's failed to build this uh, a cheap electric vehicle, for example, that can that can uh, compete with a Chinese car. So there's a lot of these sort of issues that it's facing and it's, it's a deeply complex issue as Habeck travels to China. And let's take a closer look at that crisis. German car makers are still delivering good numbers, but their share prices are flat on international stock markets. And that looks like a sign of future trouble. Industry analysts have been warning for quite some time that Germany's auto industry is driving in the wrong direction. Cars made in Germany. At one point, they were in high demand across German and international roads alike. The automotive industry is Germany's most important branch of industry with almost 800,000 employees, a billion dollar business. But its days are numbered because German car manufacturers have relied on combustion engines for too long. Germany is lagging behind in electromobility. In China today, German e-cars barely play any role. BYD has replaced Volkswagen as the market leader in the People's Republic. In the top 10 best-selling car brands in China, there's not a single German manufacturer. And now, the former top dogs are under attack in the domestic market as well. The market share of e-cars from China increased to 10% in the first quarter of 2024, and it's still growing. Chinese e-cars are smaller, lighter, and significantly cheaper. VW and its competitors are also lagging behind when it comes to onboard software with digital extras and autonomous driving. Has the German car industry missed the boat? Beatrix, what would you say to that? Can the car industry here in Germany still turn things around? What would it need to do differently tomorrow? They are turning around. We just recently had a big Congress about transformation, what is needed overall for the strategies, for sustainability, for uh, through digitalization. They are doing this. They heard the science and are moving forward. If it is the big ones, the OEMs, if it is the, small, the big suppliers, the tier one or the other ones. But of course, they need to speed up. They need to revise the processes. They cannot take ages. They cannot take too long to develop new cars or new developments overall. It must be faster. They need to learn in this way from 
the China speed, but still with uh, a German proficiency, with the German um, detailness to detail to attention, attention to detail. So I think this is what they all realized, and they are moving forward. And uh, there is still a market in China as well for the for the German cars. Yes, of course, in the E side they lagged a little bit behind. They did not really read the the legislations which were coming out from China, but they're learning and they are doing that very fast. Would you agree with that, uh, Felix? If we look at the numbers today, China's vehicle manufacturers produce cars and trucks together uh, as much as Europe and the U.S. Uh, do. So clearly they are definitely doing something right and German car makers are doing something wrong. Well, um uh, if you take a look at the Chinese e-vehicle market, there are more than 100 Chinese e-car companies. And this is also for China too much. Only probably 10 only will survive. Um, uh, uh, China created a huge overcapacity in the e-car industry. And uh, of course, this is... Uh, um, and most of them will not survive. The only question is, will uh, VW still be, or the German car makers will be still uh, the top, uh, under the top five or, the, or under the top 10? That is a big question in the e-vehicle mar market. And um, yeah, this is a, a, a difficult question if, if they can make it. Um, uh, what is shocking is the China speed. I mean, um, Germans were always very, very good uh, 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 quality-wise, and uh, uh, now the Chinese uh, competitors they they caught up on this. And still, they can uh, uh, build much faster uh, new models than what the Germans can do. And to be honest, I I, or I do see how fast developments is happening also in Wolfsburg, in Ingolstadt, and in Stuttgart. But I'm not sure if it's fast enough to compete with the Chinese competitors. Or to make up for the very long time when the German car makers were absolutely clinging to the internal combustion engine. Why did they do that? Well, uh, I remember in 2017, I was still a China correspondent in, in, in Beijing and we talked to the uh, VW uh, chief of China and he said, well, uh, the, the signs of the Chinese government were clear. They said, uh, we, will, we will go into e-vehicles e and we asked, what is VW doing? And he said, well, as long as we can sell combustion so well, why should we change? All the plans are, are, are we, the, all all plans are ready, but uh, we sh we shouldn't change un un until we s un um, because we sell so well with uh, uh, combustion, and then the, uh, and then a few years later, then uh, then the pandemic came, and uh, and the Chinese uh, uh, competitors they developed further, and the German cars didn't, and now we have this lag of a few years, and uh, it's hard to catch up now. Put that together for us, if you would, Clifford, with the last point that was made in the report, uh, the idea that the German industry is often, often lagging behind when it comes to onboard software. Would you say that the greater disruption has been decarbonization or has it been digitalization? Uh, or is it both? I think it's possibly both. Um, there's a lot of different factors at play here. Um, Germany has been very has been much faster on the decarbonisation response. Um, on the digitalisation aspect, Germany has trailed. Um, as Beatrix says, now they're taking steps to address that, but it really has fallen asleep. But I think ultimately, German car makers can't compete with China. Uh, it's not because there aren't level playing fields. It, you know, you've got this incredibly cheap workforce. You've got 300 million urban dwellers who are working in factories. The, the labour conditions are far worse. They're far cheaper than German workers. Um, there's all this, the state interests that are involved in the, in the car industry. All of these factors combine to mean that there isn't, it, it, there's no way that Germany can really compete unless, as some German car makers have suggested, that the Chinese car makers should come to Germany and make, you know, manufacture here. If they want real competition, if they want to compete in Europe, then they should manufacture in Europe. And we're seeing a little bit of that now happening, you know, but it's, um, I think this is a key point that ultimately it, it, it's, it's not like with like when it comes to competitiveness.
Let, let's drill a little deeper on that, uh, Beatrix. When you talk to uh, German car makers, what are you hearing about uh, why they believe China is now in the lead in so many ways? Is this a technological advantage, an engineering advantage, or a political advantage on the part of the Chinese uh, com competitors? It starts with a political advantage because China was already in the late 90s pushing out the policies that it went, wants to go into new energy technologies because they can't keep up with the internal combustion engine technologies to see that forward. It was not really a climate driven uh, point while they signed, of course, the Paris Agreement, but it was rather, okay, fine, where can we be in, in advance? And the state was pushing with everything they have at hand to, to push that advantage, either in the state-owned enterprises or then, of course, in any support for the startups which were then forming as of 2009. This is, of course, something which, where Germany or the German manufacturers clearly did not see the danger coming, while they, of course, already developed the cars. Well, so up to Felix point, it was already in 2019, the plant in Shanghai Volkswagen was already ready for the ID free, which was then produced there and ever since is. It's then, of course, the acceptance of the models. And yes, on the digitalization, um, as the, let's say the Europeans are not as digital natives as the Chinese are, who very, are very early adopters, very playful in all these things. And uh, the whole life in China is on the, on the mobile phone in contrast to Europe, where that is not happening. So, of course, there was then the need for the, the technology lead for the OEMs in China to, to serve that purpose. And as, of course, then the foreign manufacturers were more still in an internal combustion, in, let's say, an analog mode, then they did not catch up on that one and were had not that many engineering forces to go in that direction. And yes, it's, of course, a price question as well. Um, and where you go into, into hiring the forces, there is, of course, an abundance of engineers at the universities. There is uh, now, as well, since the last two, three years, a very high rate of uh, unemployment amongst the youth. And youth means here it's the university uh, degrees undergraduates. And this is, of course, then where China and the Chinese mm -hmm. companies have a very good point on grabbing them on very low cost. Let's come back uh, to uh, the point about Chinese political support for the industry, which means essentially industrial policy and its effects. European and U.S. companies, as well as consumers, have in fact derived massive benefits from trade with China, as we've heard. But with EU manufacturing jobs now being threatened by cheap imports, Brussels is threatening to retaliate against China's massive subsidies for targeted industries. These are the specters. E-cars from China are flooding the European market. State-subsidized and unbeatable low prices. The EU claims this is neither fair nor legal and wants to impose a tariff of 48% on e-cars from China. They say this will protect the European car market. Europe is following the USA's example, which recently quadrupled tariffs on Chinese electric vehicles to a whopping 100%. It's a risky game because it's still anyone's guess who will be punished the most by high tariffs in the end. The protections being proposed for the automotive industry could very likely lead to new trade conflicts at the end of the day. China is already threatening to retaliate while simultaneously building new factories in Hungary and Spain. Will punitive tariffs cause more harm than good? Felix, what's your answer to that question? Could punitive tariffs, if imposed by the EU as well as the U.S., wind up unleashing a full-fledged trade war? And uh, how problematic would that be for Germany? Of course, a full-scale trade war would be a big problem for a, 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 an export nation and a, a nation who's so focused on the Chinese market as Germany. But I still think that these tariffs uh, uh, are a necessary instrument. I mean, China is not playing uh, fair. 
on this and China has created over capacities in uh, uh, in, in China with e vehicles uh, of 50 million they, uh, the the whole market can absorb only 22 million so there are more than 20 million uh, car over capacities from China and they're looking for a market. The US also already closed the market, Japan did, other markets did it too. And the Europeans still think, okay, we are free will, we are free uh, market. And just to let them come, that will <laughs> create big problems. So I think the tariffs uh, are um, an important measurement to put China under pressure to negotiate with China to change this. Uh, uh, Clifford, uh, some environmental argu uh, advocates are arguing that, in fact, by shutting out cheap EVs, we are undermining our own green goals. Uh, isn't there something to that? Well, I think I think the whole argument we could talk about EVs as, as uh, and the environmental aspect of EVs. It's another argument. I mean, essentially. Uh, when you have an electronic vehicle, a lot of this is about batteries. And ultimately, BYD, for example, the car mayor, is, is a battery company. And everything they do is around building around batteries and producing batteries. And lithium battery production is pretty grim, as we've seen all these pictures. A lot of people are saying that it takes so long for, for them to become emission neutral that maybe EVs aren't the way forward. Other people are arguing in terms of hydrogen. So I think EVs themselves are not, are not a done deal in terms of being environmentally friendly. Um, and um, I think ultimately manufacturing, the, the sheer amount of metal that's going into this massive overcapacity production, it's not being done for environmental reasons, it's done totally for political and for trade reasons. Um, and so I think ultimately the environmental argument, obviously EVs are better than the in internal combustion engine, but at the same time it's, it's, it's not as simple as that. Beatrix, do you think there is anything short of punitive tariffs that can possibly influence China to change its approach? Clearly, Robert Habeck, the economy minister, is there now in part uh, in hopes that, uh, that uh, he can exercise that kind of influence. What's, what's your thinking? So number one is within these two weeks until June, uh, July 4th, where then the provisional tariffs shall be get into place. Here in, uh, here in it's Europe. Not yeah. Sorry, just pointing out that that's the European tariffs. The US ones are already in place. Yeah. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so so um, I don't think that the time until July 4th, when the provisional tariffs are getting into place, are. <clears throat> This is not enough to uh, turn everything around. I think it's to, to make a point, to point out as well uh, the German voice, which is very well heard in, in China because it is a very, very big player in China, or the both uh, the interactions between both are very, very deep and long. Um, it will still take another four months until the final tariffs are done. Are they right? Yes, I do think it is um, necessary to show China that they can, cannot just do whatever they want. Um, yes, they already planned a very long time for getting on top of the overall global economy in whatever field it is. Thinking about the China 25 policy or digital China, it is a very clearly a political layout. But on the other side, it is um, harming the consumer. It is harming exactly what you just said, the, the green goals we have. So in the final end, it helps nobody. On the other side, as long as tariffs were not in place the last two, three years when the Chinese OEMs were coming into the country, into Europe, um, there was not that much demand on Chinese EV because there is still that trust not built in. Um, they can now sponsor the, the Euro 2024, get a little bit more into the awareness, but the image is still not there. So all the Chinese OEMs still need to build up the image they have that they can deliver, that the cars are good, that they have a good service net, that they have a good representation, but still that needs to take time. So on one hand side, it's the consumer to decide, but on the other side, it is as well about pricing points where mm -hmm. the tariffs are and I think mm -hmm. it might they might be coming down or there are new um, other alternatives in mm -hmm. for example putting up the same as China did 40 years ago that you need to have a joint venture to build cars here could be another way forward as well despite the fact that there are okay. already Cherry and BYD now building up the companies but I think there are other opportunities to mm -hmm. to help out of this disaster now. Let me ask all of you, because we are slowly coming to the end of our time. Our title mentions electric shock. 
all of you are saying tariffs are needed. Are you not concerned that a full decoupling from China could unleash the end of globalization, which would be a very big electric shock indeed? Clifford? Um, I think uh, I think that a certain amount of disengagement is inevitable because clearly we have two very different systems here. And um, there's been such a, a free reign for the way China's behaved for the last while that it was inevitable that people were finally going to take stock and say that this can't go go on that way. Um, I think that ultimately uh, things will settle down and there will be uh, trade again and uh, going forward. But. Um, Felix? Decoupling is definitely not a good solution. It would end to a catastrophe for Germany and China and probably the whole world. But de-risking, yes, we have to talk about it. Tariffs of 100% in the US, 40% in Europe. Is that decoupling or de-risking? De-risking. De-risking. Beatrix, one word. Are we about to see a big anti-globalization backlash? Not anti-globalization, but looking more into a regionalization. So regional, uh, go forward, local, um, it, it needs to go that way. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us. And thanks to you, our viewers, for tuning in. Check out our YouTube channel and tell us what you think. Bye-bye.